Hi, geology kids. Time for a little bit of a lecture on 9-2, which deals with fossils and correlation of rock and dating based on fossil evidence. So this is kind of a biggie in this class because we like to get out and head to the hills and out south of town and look for fossils. And most of you guys have picked up fossils before. So you might have some questions about, well, what makes things a fossil and uh, how does it come about? And we kind of touch on it, how the how and then where and why it's important in terms of uh, geology class here. So go ahead and hide this and I'm going to start the show. And then I'm going to hit my, hit my oh, oh, I just went bye bye. There it is. So he, uh, I don't want to change the focus. Now I'm going to back up again. Don't you love Microsoft just throwing crap in there all the time like that? But so let's get the markup going here. Pointer options pen. Well, what is a fossil? A fossil is essentially some sort of uh, uh, piece of record in the rock that shows that there was life living at some point when that uh, rock layer was deposited. And it doesn't always have to be an animal. It doesn't have to be a dinosaur. It can be a plant, it can be tracks of an animal, it can be any kind of trace of like a worm trail. All those things are considered fossils. It's just evidence of prehistoric life. Now, if you're gonna get into studying fossils, uh, you become what's called a paleontologist. And paleontology, just like any branch of science, has multiple facets to it. You can study dinosaur paleontology, you can study invertebrate paleontology, you can study, um, essentially bio uh, paleobiology which is a form of paleontology it looks like plants and, and it can get really nitpicky and all different levels there uh, but the whole point of this is we're trying to figure out past environmental conditions that made those things live in the environments that they lived in and how does that compare to today because if you remember the the past is the key to the present and vice versa and we can see things on earth that are kind of like maybe what happened many years ago. Plus fossils help us date rocks over distance. So if we're getting the same kind of fossil here as I'm getting over in China or I'm getting down in Argentina, now we're saying, well, that means that these uh, layers of rock are all about the same age. Because if we look around the world right now, well, what kind of things are living? Well, obviously humans, uh, different types of mammals, things like that. And eventually if we have deposition of us and different things, uh, they'll become fossilized in the future. We'll say, well, all these things were living at that time and they were buried at that time. So we talk about types of fossils, what makes a fossil? Well, if we're looking at like dinosaur bones or pieces of wood or like what we call uh, petrified wood or fossilized wood, what they have to do is they have to go through a process of what we call uh, permineralization. Because most things, uh, living things, are made of the chinops. So they're made of carbon, they're made of nitrogen, they're made of oxygen and uh, phosphorus and hydrogen. And like you guys have a bunch of calcium in your bones and things like that. So those elements, looks like CG, but that's a CA. Those elements um, are what make you, and obviously if you look at a bone, that's like from uh, an animal that's died out on the prairie, it's full of all kinds of holes and stuff, and it's made mostly of calcium. And if that bone gets buried, that calcium actually gets, and the holes in the bone actually get replaced, not with calcium, they get replaced with uh, silica, and they get replaced with oxygen most of the time. Reason being is in Earth's crust, oxygen is number one. And oxygen likes to combine with silica, which is the number two element in the crust. So typically, permineralization means you're changing some of these elements, and these guys are taking the place and cementing them all together. Now, that's if we're talking like bones and things like that. If it's a mold or a cast, can they be silicified? Yes, because underground water tends to pick up silica because silica is so common in the soil. And that can also create a cast, which a cast is basically, oops, I'll go back to here. A cast is a solidified like trace of an animal or a part of a hard piece of an animal. So types of fossils, we can have something called carbonization, which in a carbonization type situation, 
uh, you're going to have an organism that gets buried and um, it gets compressed into music. A lot of times carbonization occurs in like a silty or a sandstone layer. And then it leaves behind this kind of a darkish like imprint that is essentially carbon, like almost like coal that gets left behind. And we call that a carbonization impression. Um, sometimes that carbonization gets replaced by iron and you'll see uh, like an iron oxide type thing. So if you go out in the Badlands and you break open a rock, you'll see leaves that are all, they look like they're rusty. Well, in that case, you've got a rusty leaf that uh, was probably a carbon film or a carbon impression that, and that carbon got replaced with iron oxide. Um, some of you guys have probably heard of ab amber, what amber is about. If you've ever seen, of course, all the Jurassic Park movies, um, the big thing in Jurassic Park is they, oops, that should be a P, not an R, but in Jurassic Park, they had a big chunk of amber. And if you remember inside the amber, you had this mosquito living in there. And then uh, the mosquito, they were able to take and dig it out of the amber and extract prehistoric blood out of it and the supposedly had dinosaur DNA. And then they were able to replicate dinosaurs based on finding fossilized mosquitoes in amber. Well, I've got news for you. That is not probably ever going to work. Because if you did that, you'd probably get, uh, you'd get mostly mosquito DNA, not dinosaur DNA out of that mosquito. But... That is kind of the premise of Jurassic Park. Now, if you've ever been around pine type trees, if you lived in places where you have all kinds of like uh, spruce trees, pines, different coniferous trees, they always have that really sticky um, resin on it, which is basically pine tar or whatever. Well, it can solidify and fossilize. And yeah, insects can get stuck in it. You can get stuck in it. You're probably not going to fossilize, but you can get stuck in it. So that's what we call amber fossilization. Uh, a trace fossil comes in lots of different types. You can have tracks that were left by animals. You can have burrows that were left. Uh, a type of burrow that you find around here is something that we call a scolithos. It starts with S, K, and O. A scolithos is when you have a worm that burrows through a layer and it leaves a hole behind and gets fossilized. Uh, corporalite. Everybody loves this one because a corpolite is essentially a big old piece of poop. And yes, we have found corpolites in class here, and I'll show you some, which is fossilized uh, like dinosaur poop. Um, a gastrolith is something that dinosaurs would use to grind up their food, kind of like what um, uh, birds have in their in their craw and their crop that helps grind up the food they eat. Dinosaurs had gastroliths too, or stones, literally stones in their stomachs that got rolled around and smooth. And you can find those. That's a trace fossil. Um, here's examples. You got petrified wood here, which is silicified wood. It was mostly, wood is mostly made of carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and hydrogen. Well, some of that got replaced with silica, made it hard. Here we call it fossilized or petrified wood here. You find it all over. We'll find it out in the Badlands here too. Uh, here's an example of a trilobite mold and a cast. This is the cast or the mold, I should say, or I should say the cast. And then the mold is the impression that gets left behind. Uh, here'd be a carbonized fossilized bee. Notice it's kind of blacky, coaly looking. That can sometimes turn more of a reddish iron oxide -y. You get down into uh, parts of Wyoming. There's a great big ridge. It's full of all kinds of fish fossils like this. We got some of those actually in the lab here. Uh, here's a piece of uh, amber that's got a spider that's inside of it that's fossilized. And, of course, who doesn't like fossilized poo? So that's corpolite. Uh, conditions that are going to favor fossil preservation, in other words, when we find stuff out here in the Badlands, you very rarely, rarely are you going to find something that's complete like this. Um, that's a fossilized mammoth. We have found one of those in Dawson County in 1967. I'll show you the film on that. It was out by Lindsay. It's one of the most famous mammoth sites in all of North America, the Lindsay Mammoth, found just to the north and east of Lindsay. Um, the big thing about fossilization, if you're going to get a full-size fossil, you've got to have something that gets buried rapidly. And then it usually has to have hard parts that can uh, withstand being buried and they don't break down over time. There's actually a whole branch of geology that studies this that's called taphonomy. It starts with a TA and it's a PH. And so we call that taphonomy. 
And at MSU, we have people that come and they actually do uh, taphonomy studies of fossils in this area. And what, basically what they're doing is they're letting dead stuff get buried and then they study how it can fossilize over time. Um, here's a case in the book. They got a picture here from Brea, California. Uh, Brea, California is home of the famous Brea tar pits. And the Brea tar pits are in the greater Los Angeles area. They're a suburb of Los Angeles. And uh, here you can see this is actually Site 91. And during the Ice Age, there's lots of animals that got uh, trapped in this tar. They got buried quickly, and then they've been preserved over time in the Brea tar pits. Things like saber-toothed cats and uh, mammoths and other prehistoric horses and things like that they've found in this pit in the greater LA basin there. It's actually kind of an interesting place. The big thing with fossils that helps us in geology is that we can correlate different layers from different regions based on the fossils that are in them. Um, and this gives us, a, like it says, a comprehensive view of the rock record throughout the planet. And we can say that, yeah, these things were all deposited at the same time. So what we try to do, like it says here, we match up rocks of similar ages from different regions based on the fossils in there. And we actually have a principle about that called the principle of uh, uh, fossil or faunal assemblages, which we'll talk about here in a second. But the big thing is, as we look over large areas, in some cases we can have fossils that were alive over much of the earth at one point in time, and we call those index fossils. Uh, in terms of correlation, uh, wow, this looks a lot like Makoshika, doesn't it? Oh, wait, no, this looks a lot like Makoshika, doesn't it? Oh, wait, this looks a lot like Makoshika, does it? Why? Guess what? The same types of rocks found in Makoshika can also be found in this case in the Lance uh, Formation of Wyoming. In this case, in the Frenchman Formation of the province of Saskatchewan. And in this case, um, I think it's the Schofield uh, pro uh, Formation of Alberta. So this is three very different locations. And there's another one even actually over towards Bismarck called the Cannonball Formation, well, it's similar, that have the same age as rocks. And by golly, look, guys, they look roughly the same in all three cases as Makoshika. And guess what? All of them have dinosaur fossils in them. Well, that's a pretty nice looking dinosaur there. I can't even draw teeth, but I'll draw the mean eye. Okay, it's a dead dead dinosaur in there, okay? But all of them have that, that same faunal fossil assembly, dinosaur bearing beds, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Wyoming, and just like here, Montana. We call it the Hell Creek here. Here is a diagram from your book that shows how you can correlate layers of the Grand Canyon over large expanses. Actually, uh, they show it right here in the bottom inset and most of all of... Uh, of uh, Arizona, northern Arizona, but you also see the same rocks up in Utah and up in clear up into parts of Montana. You can see some of these same layers. So fossil correlation, like I said, the big principle here is called the principle of faunal succession or fossil succession. States of fossils are arranged according to their age. And a lot of the stuff like I talked about earlier, the names of all the different periods and stuff are because the British in the in the time of the Industrial Revolution, we're building all kinds of canals across Britain, and they're the ones that figured out that, hmm, if I find fossils in this part of Britain that are the same in this part of Britain, it must be the same age rock. And when you guys did your timelines, you actually labeled the age of the trilobites, which is early Paleozoic, the age of the fishes, which is kind of the middle, late Paleozoic, and then the age of the reptiles, which, which starts in the Mesozoic, and now we're living in the age of uh, mammals. So this is the principle of over time the fossils have changed from those different ages. That's the principle of faunal succession or fossil succession. Index fossils are interesting because they're fossils that didn't live very long in terms of earth history, but they were spread throughout the whole world. And they live, so these are really important fossils. Trilobites are one, dinosaurs are a type of index fossil. Um, there are certain types of um, uh, cephalopods that are that way too. Uh, if all of a sudden we had an asteroid hit Earth right now, 
smokes everybody in the world so all people die and then we get deposited on top of and then maybe insects take over the world after us uh humans would be actually a pretty good index fossil because humans have only been around on earth for a relatively short amount of time but we've been everywhere so yeah humans would make a great index fossil in the future if we would die off now uh fossil assemblages like it says, can be used to identify a rock bed that does not contain any index fossils. In other words, it can be on either top or bottom of it and say, well, this, this layer doesn't have any fossils, but the ones above it and below it do. And that's what we see when we look ahead coming into this. Some people actually, here's some index fossils here that are basically uh, really microscopic in size. They don't always have to be like big dinosaurs and things like that. They can be like certain types of pollens and diatoms that are living, little tiny creatures that live in the ocean. So don't be thinking that every index fossil is some great big thing you're going to go out and dig up. No, they can be really, really tiny. Um, here's a fossil assemblage that shows uh, we're looking at rock unit A, and it shows how – did I lose my pointer here? I don't know where it went to. Yeah, I did. Oh, it's, it's up over there. But you're going to see this diagram even in one of your worksheets where we're going to take and correlate layers based on fossils that are in them. And you can see that uh, some of these make better index fossils than others. You can close it up. I don't care about Mars. Oh, see Mars best tonight. Well, okay. Good deal. Why do they keep sending me this stuff? And why is my mouse not working? I've got a better piece of paper here. Oh, there we go. I'm going to back up. I hate Microsoft constantly interrupting me. Eh. Well, okay. Fossils, like it says, can be used to infer information about past environments. And that's the whole point of studying fossils is that we can look at, and this is a big one with shells and seawater and things like that. Certain types of organisms in the ocean only live at certain temperatures and certain pH and certain salinities and things like that. So. We know that by looking at certain things in the ocean today and the environments they live in, we can correlate that to previous environments. So if you didn't realize this, the earth is about 75% water for oceans, you know. So a lot of the organisms that you're going to dig up that are fossils are actually marine fossils, and we can compare those to today. And like it says, corals is a big one. Can we find fossilized coral here? Yes, we can. And Corals are very indicative of certain water temperatures. So fossils are kind of interesting things. And that's why we'll do more stuff out in the field with fossils moving ahead. And uh, we'll talk about them in a little bit more detail as we actually study them. You'll have to learn some of the ones that are common here. You'll have to draw them in your notebook. And then we'll have to we'll go out and make you have to find them. And hopefully the weather stays nice enough so we can do that for a long period of time. So. Okay, I'm going to sign out for now, and this is the end of 9.2 lecture, and there'll be some questions down in the description that are based on the lecture. Make sure they answer those and get them in by the due date of uh, when they should be turned in. So, signing off for now, I'm going to discard those, and we're going to kill this, and there's the weather. Red flag warning. Rut row, kid.